We're gonna mm -hmm. recording too. Okay. There's a lot of people hopping on. Thank you for joining us. We're probably gonna get started a couple minutes after five just to give people a chance to log in get settled. But if you're already joining us, if you wanted to type your name and where you're from in the chat, we would love to see where we have uh, visitors from. We already have 75. Wow, Austria, that's awesome. Edmonton, Missoula. Breckenridge, Colorado, Boise, Idaho, oh my gosh, Kentucky, New Jersey, Bozeman, New York in the middle of a snowstorm. This is pretty cool. It's like coast to coast to coast. Uh huh. Well, maybe not quite coast to coast to coast, but uh, well, we have it's still early. There's still minutes. Yeah, we had California and New Jersey, so we're pretty much coast to coast. California to New Jersey is pretty much coast to coast. There's Jesse. Hi. Hi, Jesse. Sorry to join at the last minute here. I am um, anyway had some computer issues, but I'm here. Awesome. We just have people signing on in. We're just checking out where they're all from, coast to coast so far, and Canada even. A couple from Calgary, mm -hmm. Edmonton, yeah, Canmore. Yeah. So for those of you just joining us, we're probably going to give it a couple more minutes just to get give people a chance to get settled in. Um, if you wanna pop where you're from in the chat, we've been reading those and we have people from all over. Vermont, Virginia, Washington. Nevada. That's oh, Francis. Oh, Francis and Ernie. Alaska, mm -hmm. Nanton, Alberta. That did it, coast yeah. to coast to coast. Yeah. Juno yeah. just knocked it over. <laughs> Farthest you could go is waiting for Alaska. That's awesome. This is one nice thing about our scenarios that we've been able to do some really cool events and bring people from all over the world together in one moment. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's the Mortensons. Martha from Jackson. Francis and Ernie. All over. I saw a question about how you can't see everyone, just the panelists. So we're doing this webinar style, so you won't be able to see or hear the other participants. Uh, we decided to do this a little bit differently this time because we had almost 300 people register. So we have an Austrian from, from Europe. So beyond coast to coast, really. <laughs> <laughs> This is this is really exciting, actually, mm -hmm. watching all the chats come in of everybody yeah. from all over. What do you think, Renee? Do we want to give it another minute or should I go ahead and get us started? We're at 158 people. Why don't we get started? Because, you know, 
Yeah. You and I have the boring stuff. Well, not you don't have the boring stuff. I have the boring <laughs> stuff to do, actually. I will try to get through it as quickly as I can. So welcome and thank you all so much for coming and joining the National Museum of Wildlife Art in partnership with Yellowstone to Yukon for this webinar, What Bears Teach Us. Uh, my name is Sarah Ann Platt and I am the Associate Curator of Education and Outreach at the museum. And I just wanted to start us off by saying that we're so grateful for this partnership that is formed uh, between us and Y2Y. -Y. And we look forward to doing many more of these events in the future. And lastly, I wanted to read a brief land acknowledgement for the state of Wyoming as the National Museum of Wildlife Art resides in the town of Jackson Hole. So every community owes its existence and vitality to generations from around the world who contributed their hopes, dreams, and energy to making the history that led to this moment. Some were brought here against their will, some were drawn to leave their distant homes in hopes of a better life, and some have lived on this land for more generations that can be counted. Truth and acknowledgement are critical to building mutual respect and connection across all barriers of heritage and difference. We begin this effort to acknowledge what has been buried by honoring the truth. We are in Jackson on the ancestral lands of the Eastern Shoshone tribe of Wyoming, and we acknowledge others, the Arapaho, Bannock, Blackfeet, Cheyenne, Crow, Grovant, Kiowa, Nez Perce, and Ute tribes who have, had, who have historic ties to this place. We pay respects to their elders past and present. Please take a brief moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us together here today. With that, I wanna thank you all very much for being here today. And I will pass on the virtual mic to Renee. Hello everyone. It's so great to see you all. Well, not see you, I guess see the chats in any case. Um, welcome to the National Museum of Wildlife Art and Why Do Why's Intersection series. Um, my name is Renee Crisco and I'm the Donor Relations Manager for Yellowstone to Yukon Conservation Initiative. Um, we're really excited about this, this uh, series of speakers. The intersection uh, series is basically highlighting that crossroads between science, art, and nature. And today's speaker certainly does a little bit of that. I'm tasked with the very exciting housekeeping reminders. So number one, um, sorry, uh, Anne already mentioned that we are in webinar mode, so we will not be able to see you um, or hear you, but we can certainly read your chat. Um, if you do have any technical difficulties, please write a note in the chat and uh, sorry, Anne will help get you sorted out. We are reserving the Q&A section and that is, uh, or the Q&A chat for those questions and answers. Feel free to type in some questions and answers throughout the presentation as they pop up in your mind. Um, and then of course, at the very end of this talk, we will be taking some questions and answers. Sarah will be happy to answer those questions and we also have um, Harvey Locke here, who is from Yellowstone to Yukon as well, Nick Clark and Jesse Grossman, who are both program staff at y to y and work extensively throughout the United States. So we're super happy to have them on board as well. I am now going to pass the mic over to someone who is no stranger to the museum and really does not need much of an introduction. Um, he's a passionate conservationist and co-founder and senior advisor, both to Yellowstone to Yukon Conservation Initiative and Nature Needs Half, Harvey Locke. Hello, everyone. How wonderful to be together virtually, if not in person. Um, we have a really wonderful tradition of doing interesting talks together with the National Museum of Wildlife Art. And I'm coming to you from Banff National Park up in Canada. And our speaker tonight, Sarah Emiligi, is from Canmore, which is just right next door, but outside the park. So um, we, we live in a landscape that I always think of as being very similar to the area around Jackson. And we have lots in common. And that's, of course, why we do this speaker series together. And um, Sarah is a, a person who was born in Calgary. Um, so she's a Westerner like, like me. And she has spent her life uh, being passionate about bears, studying them, hanging out in their habitat, studying them right through to a PhD um, on their behavior. And uh, she told me once something that blew my mind, and that is there's a trail near my house that I walk maybe 30 times a year. 
And I also, my wife and I, Mary Eve, go into the back country of the park a lot and camp out in the wild areas of the park. And that's a lot of fun for me. And she said, you know, you're far more likely to see a grizzly bear right near your house than you are in the back country. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, really? <laughs> like, <laughs> I carry my bear spray in the back country. I don't carry it when I walk from my house. It's like, oh, maybe I should be listening to something here. There's some science that maybe <laughs> I should know. So anyway, Sarah's going to help us with that kind of story tonight. And I think I'm looking forward to it very much. Um, Sarah knows this landscape, she knows about bears, and I'm going to let her tell you all about it. So thanks all for joining. Thanks so much, Harvey. Um, that's so that's funny. I remember that conversation too, actually. I told Mediev the same thing. I was like, you're going to see bears right around your house more than in the backcountry. That was one of the most interesting things that came out of my PhD data, and uh, I, I like that one a lot. Um, okay, so if we're ready, I'll start sharing my screen. Sorry, Anne, is that, does that sound good? That sounds great. And if the rest of the panelists want to mute and turn off their videos to enjoy Sarah's wonderful presentation, you can do that as well. Okay, I just want to make sure you're looking at my title slide now. It looks good, Sarah. Perfect. Uh, so... Okay, uh, so thank you so much uh, for having me come and talk today. I'm so excited about all the people in the chat and where everybody's from. I, I thought I was gonna be talking to a group of people in Jackson, but I mean, maybe not. <laughs> I love it, I love it so much. I'm very excited to talk about my book, What Bears Teach Us, uh, which is a joint effort between myself and a good friend of mine, John Marriott, who's a wildlife photographer. Um, I'm going to be doing some readings from the book and just sharing uh, some of my experiences with bears and what I've learned about coexistence over the years. <clears throat> uh, so every photo is John's unless I tell you otherwise. One of the great things about this talk today is that it's with the National Museum of Wildlife Art and I'm so happy to be invited to do this talk. One of the, um, one of the I, wouldn't, I don't wanna say conditions, but one of the deals of doing this talk was that the Wildlife Museum asked me, or the Wildlife Art Museum asked me to include some bear related art. And I love that idea so much because one of the things I love most about working with bears is how they have ingrained themselves into our culture. And what better way to demonstrate that than through art. I wanted to start with this particular piece because it reminded me of our history with bears, but also that they are just a big part of a much larger ecosystem. I also love that it's like a woman cowboy, that, and that's just kind of awesome. Uh, some of you have also emailed in questions in advance of tonight's talk, and I'm gonna try my best to answer them, but please keep in mind that there is the Q&A at the end if I run out of time. So I just wanna take a little bit of a step back and tell you about myself, but also just the underlying, my underlying philosophy of this. And that is that really anytime we have an interaction with a wild animal, we come to that interaction with all of our preconceived notions and expectations of how that is going to go. Our relationship with nature and wild animals starts from the moment we go outside. I grew up in Alberta, Canada, as Harvey said, and I spent my childhood recreating in Alberta's parks. We knew that bears were there and we often took efforts not to run into them. My mom used to buy me a can of Coke at the top, at the trailhead to get me to the top of the hike, <clears throat> which was always a special treat because I didn't have a lot of soda in my life. The second treat was that when I finished the Coke, I'd put rocks in the can and I could shake it all the way up the trail. That tells the bears you're coming, my mom would say. Fast forward to my adult life and I had always believed I should never want to encounter a bear because they are dangerous and could hurt me. And that's true for sure, but it's definitely not that simple. Over the years, I've come to learn that bears are so much more than scary stories told in the newspaper or fluffy teddy bears from TV. My master's work showed me that bears didn't always want to run away from people. And my PhD taught me that how bears select habitat around people depends on many different things, but it mostly depends on the individual bear. 
Throughout my research, I have learned that regardless of where you are and what bear population you're working with, the human experience is an essential part of the encounter. Coexistence is defined by us, how we perceive the risk and outcomes of these encounters. Tonight, I'm gonna to challenge you to think about how you define coexistence, what it means to you and what you're willing to do to get there. When I first became a bear biologist, I thought I would be working with bears exclusively, <laughs> but I was pretty wrong. <laughs> As usual, bears showed me that my assumptions weren't always correct. And I frequently come back to this statement from one of my master's supervisors that wildlife management is usually just as much people management. If we are going to effectively manage for human bear coexistence, we need to consider that we will in effect be managing people. Rarely do we manage bears directly. It's ironic because we often think of managing wildlife because of what we as people need. But really, if we manage ourselves for what we need, we need to think about how we manage ourselves. <laughs> I'll get more into that tonight. In terms of research, this idea has prompted me to incorporate social science with biological science. And that helps me create final management recommendations that address bears biological needs while addressing the perspectives of people, since most management recommendations pertain to, the, to people's land use in one way or another. In terms of the conservation work I do, keeping people in mind helps me to think about what we can all do to make the lives of bears better. Throughout my research, I became more and more aware of the individual variation within bears. This idea was reflected in my data, but it was also something I witnessed every day. Over my years working with bears, I had become very aware of their personalities, events that had happened to them that predisposed them to act in certain ways. These things could be reflected with data points. Working for government, I had to create a plan, I had to create plans based on what I thought most bears would do, but I knew that I could never address all of the things that bears do. I began to think about what bears had taught me and how that shaped my perceptions of them on the landscape. Also during my time away from research, I began to think as a recreationist again. I began to watch other people's interactions with bears or listen to other people's stories. I began to understand how the things that bears had taught me through my research framed my expectations of every encounter I had, but other people hadn't been taught those same things. I wanted to share what bears had taught me, not just the science behind my research, but what they had taught me about who they were and who I am when I'm with them. I pitched the idea to John Marriott. My text, your pictures, awesome meets awesome. It wasn't a hard sell. This is John and I. John and I met over a decade ago when I first moved to Canmore. And over that time, we've worked on a few different projects together. All of those projects have been about communicating bear conservation issues or influencing habitat management to protect bear access to high quality habitat. What I like about working with John is that we're on the same page. We both value bears and their right to exist in a landscape where they are free to access the foods they like without people getting in the way. We both believe that people can take actions to improve the human bear relationship and that it's easier to ask people to cut down a crab apple tree in their yard than it is to ask a bear not to eat delicious crab apples. Over the years, we've gotten to know each other's families. We hang out, we philosophize, we share meals, and sometimes we even talk about things other than bears. He's a good friend, and I'm so lucky to get to do a project like this with him. We are a bear dream team. Joking, not joking. So what is our book about? As a scientist, I value data, and there's a ton of research about bear behavior and habitat use that the average person may not have access to. Through my work and my play, I've been blessed to spend hour upon hour with bears, watching them, writing down what they're doing, and trying to understand why they do what they do. I've been elated, mystified, scared, curious, surprised, inspired, and nervous. When I think about it, a lot of what I have learned about bears and from them come from my own personal bear stories, but it's hard to describe what it's like to look into those deep brown eyes. How could I possibly put into words the depth of emotion and decision-making that I see when I look into a bear's eyes? That's why I need John. Our book weaves the science of bear behavior with stories from the field with John's amazing photos to bring you North America's bears in a way that you've never maybe seen, you've never seen them before. 
maybe. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna tell you the first couple paragraphs. I'm gonna read the first couple paragraphs from the book because um, this is where it really all began. <laughs> the first time I looked into the deep brown eyes of a grizzly bear, I think I stopped breathing. This is, and this is a photo of that bear. This is a photo of that moment. For a moment, all was still. I was doing something I had been told never to do. I was sitting mere meters away from one of North America's largest carnivores, looking him right in the eyes. He looked back at me with a lazy, quizzical expression. A lazy strand of water dripped from his lips as he munched on long blades of sedge grass from the estuary shore. I just stared. Thoughts raced through my mind. What would happen now? What would he do? What would I do? Was this safe? This was crazy. Nobody should be this close to a bear. What am I even doing here? I was stranded in space and time, unable to move and unable to speak. But then I exhaled and relaxed. The bear just kept chewing grass as if he didn't even care I was there. I could hear his tongue and saliva processing the grass and swallowing it. I could hear him breathing. Even though I was in a small Zodiac boat with several other people, in that moment, it was just me and this big, beautiful bear. His eyes were soft, quiet, and relaxed. I was not confronted by the vicious man-eating carnivore I had grown up to believe grizzly bears were. Although he was massive with long claws and long teeth, I felt no fear, just wonder and a little confusion. Was everything I assumed to be true about bears wrong? Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit of background for you about the three species of bears that we have in North America. We've got black grizzly and polar bears. And they all live in different places and are adapted to live in their environments in different ways. So um, black bears, for example, have shorter claws because they like to climb trees. Grizzly bears have this big hump on their back that's made for digging, so they're excellent. I call them the rototillers of the alpine. And polar bears have a whole array of adaptations to allow them to live in one of the, what I think one of the harshest climates on earth probably is. All bear species in North America have experienced range contraction due to various human events and development. But regardless, all bears have things in common. They hibernate and they give birth in the den. The length of hibernation depends on if they are giving birth or if they have cubs with them, especially for polar bears. A lot of dominant males will hibernate for the least amount of time. Male bears will try and kill cubs to bring a female back into estrus so she can be mated again. And that's what makes a mama bear so fierce. She's evolved to protect her cubs from a bigger male bear and she will fight to the death if need be. But I wanna talk more about our relationship with bears and how that has changed over time from bears being persecuted to being a source of entertainment, to defining us versus them spaces, to coexistence. So we have a long relationship with bears and arguably we're still in the paradigm shift towards coexistence. We have work to do, but we're getting there. I'm just gonna read you another little excerpt from the book. Today we know that drawing a hard line and expecting bears or people not to cross it doesn't work. We work, um, <clears throat> we work toward allowing bears and people to coexist in the same place at the same time as safely as possible. This is still hugely controversial. People occasionally get hurt. Bears still get killed more often than we'd like to admit. Sometimes we have great successes like installing bear resistant garbage bins in communities and reducing the number of bears walking through a town in search of food. Other times we fail, such as when a bear is walking on trails near a community and people intrude on the bear's space until eventually the situation becomes unsafe and the bear is relocated or destroyed. It's complex. There are no simple solutions. I truly believe, however, that if we open our hearts and our minds to the possibilities of seeing these animals differently again, then we can truly achieve coexistence. This is a classic example, this piece of art, I love it. 
Uh, this is a classic example of what I'm talking about. It's a great painting from 1925, which shows a pretty long relationship with bears right there, uh, showing bears being bears and the undying human need to record that. Uh, bears are charismatic. We're drawn to them. We love watching them engage in different behaviors. They're cute and cuddly and fierce all at the same time. But it wasn't until I started writing a book that I began to see that this behavior portrayed in this photo is more likely to be patience, just as much as a fun image captured. So patience and tolerance is the first chapter in my book. And it's really where the book began to take shape in my mind. Bears, particularly those living in high human use areas show incredible patience. I'm often amazed by how few bear attacks there actually are when I consider human behavior in bear habitat. I giggle at the thought that I would make a bad bear because I would bluff charge too many people for violating my personal space while I was trying to eat lunch. There are many questionable things that people do to get close to a bear for a photo or a story to tell their friends. Many people get far too close and most of the time the bear does nothing. Few people would be so patient and tolerant as an Alberta bear if they had dozens of people closing in on them to take a photo while they were eating. Bears in these cases may even be justified in huffing and growling or even swatting people away. Yet most roadside bears continue eating or just amble off. Bears display patience and tolerance with people and other bears, but they also can become habituated or food conditioned. To the average person recreating or living in bear habitat, these terms seem synonymous, but to the wildlife manager, each of these terms is different and comes with a unique series of assumptions, understandings, and management actions. What makes a bear tolerant or habituated often has a lot to do with what they eat. So I started my work with grizzly bears working in a place called the Kootsmateen, which is the north end of the Great Bear Rainforest on the British Columbia coast. And there's two things that are in abundance in the rainforest, water and salmon. These two things change everything about the ecosystem. Obviously everything is wet because it's a rainforest and everything is growing all the time because it's so wet. But anybody who's a gardener knows that water isn't enough to make plants grow. You need fertilizer. And that's where the salmon comes in. Salmon feeds everything in this ecosystem from the large carnivores in the ocean like orcas and seals and sea lions to the bears and wolves on land. When a bear eats a salmon, it may not eat the entire fish. It usually just eats the brains and sex organs as they are the highest in fats and proteins. The rest of the salmon is scavenged by wolves and ravens who take the carcass into the forest and away from competitive bears. They eat what they want of the salmon and leave the rest to rot in the forest. The salmon, who has been living in deep ocean for four years, has accumulated an abundance of nitrogen in its skeleton. As it decomposes, the big cedars absorb that deep water nitrogen and get their fill of fertilizer. In this way, the salmon feeds nearly every species in the rainforest. From the spring to the fall, the Kootsmateen is a rich bear habitat with consistently plentiful high protein food. With limited interference from humans, bears are free to eat as much as they want. Bears here are very tolerant of people and other bears. Apart from mating season, it is uncommon to see bears in proximity without signs. It is not uncommon, sorry, to see bears in proximity without signs of conflict. This is largely because there's no need to compete for food when there's so much of it. In this ecosystem, truly the biggest threat to a bear is another bigger bear. And as long as that other bear is well fed, which they are, then you're probably good. Bears don't need to invest energy in defending their food sources. And this tolerance also translates into a high degree of tolerance to people, which is optimal for bear viewing. Over the years in the Kootsmateen, the bears show less signs of stress and aggression. Life is good and easy here. The abundance of food makes bears more relaxed, but in the interior, it may be opposite. Less food, less resources, and more people contribute to bears feeling more defensive, perhaps, and having a lower tolerance for disturbance. I explore this idea more in my book and talk about how that influences our management actions to keep bears and people safe. In the interior, or in Alberta where I live, bears are different here. <clears throat> we can't get as close to bears, but why is that? Well, there are two key differences between coastal grizzly bear habitat 
and interior grizzly bear habitat. First, there's no salmon. There's less food. So no matter how you look at this landscape, it is subpar at best. With less food, bears need to wander larger distances to find it, which means they expend more energy. This also means there's more competition between bears and there's more at stake and bears are less tolerant of being disturbed by other people or other bears. That brings me to the other key difference. So many people. I just read a little excerpt from the book here. Whether a bear is well fed or not is tied to its tolerance level, <clears throat> which in turn is tied to the risk of human bear conflict. The fewer the resources, the less tolerant the bear will be to disturbance and the higher the risk of conflict or of a bear being displaced from high quality habitat in an effort to avoid conflict. This, however, is an oversimplification as there is a great variation in the behaviors of individual bears. There are bears who live in the Bow Valley of Alberta who are more habituated to people than others, which can work out very well for them. It affords them access to the relatively little available high quality habitat around human communities, especially if other bears are not willing to access it. It is dangerous, however, because once these bears leave the protection of the national or provincial parks, they are at high risk of conflict with people and will be treated differently. It also poses a safety risk to people because there is no way for us to know exactly where a bear will draw the line. A bear may appear comfortable around people, but over time, exposure to too many people may result in a bear feeling it needs to defend its berry patch. Or worse, the bear may become too comfortable around people and end up in an urban environment accessing garbage and becoming food conditioned. Bears that select habitat near people walk a fine line between success and human bear conflict in which the bear always loses. Whether a bear is habituated or tolerant depends partially on where it grew up. Just like people, bears are, bears are a reflection of their childhood. And this influences the selection of appropriate bear management strategies. Although the bear in this painting looks pretty robust, that may be less common in interior habitats unless it's the fall, which it is in this case. <laughs> in the fall, bears enter what is called hyperphagia, or as I like to call it, everything in my belly time. They are eating as much as possible to gain as much weight as possible before hibernation. <clears throat> that hibernation is brought on by a lack of food availability. In most populations, bears hibernate in October or November, except some dominant males who will stay up in December if there's still food available somewhere. Bears hibernate in some kind of depression in the ground under a tree root mass or they dig themselves a little pit. The den is usually as small as it can be for them to lay down and turn around. How we manage bears and how people interact with them depends on where we are, what kinds of bears are there and what kinds of people are there. The type of management response is highly dependent on the level of human activity and human demands on the surrounding landscape. In Alaska bear viewing sites, people are strictly managed to facilitate viewing experiences. The predictability of human use is essential to keep bears and people safe in these encounters. If bears know when and where to expect people, they can decide whether they want to be around people. The predictability of human use in space and time has allowed a highly tolerant bear population to become tolerant of people. Bears have the freedom to decide their level of human interaction which reduces the change, which reduces the chance of a defensive response to people. Bears in this area may still experience an internal stress response, but have decided that the benefit of access to a rich source of salmon are worth it. In human dominated landscapes, like Alberta and the lower 48 US states, human use is less predictable, resources are scarcer and bears are less tolerant. In protected areas, people can be on any road or trail at almost any time. And this lack of predictability means that bears don't always get to decide when and where to access habitat in the absence of people. In these landscapes, we often aim to avoid bears becoming habituated because those that do may have a higher risk of becoming food conditioned, such as the bears that broke into this uh, mess of stuff and garbage. <laughs> Once that is the case, Management action is almost always required to ensure public safety to prevent bears from becoming food conditioned. Sorry, <clears throat> to prevent bears from becoming food conditioned, managing agencies usually have plans in place to discourage bears from coming near human developments. 
This can involve aversive conditioning, which involves a bear being hazed with non-lethal means to leave human inhabited areas. This can be successful if it is consistently applied, but it doesn't always address the human behavior, which may be the root of the problem. All right, I'm gonna flip back over into storytelling mode now and share with you a special moment that John and I shared in the Kutsmatin uh, during the spring of 2019 when we were writing this book. The Kutsmatin is a special place for both John and I. We've both done a lot of work there independently. And so we had a really good trip up there together uh, to, to find some photos and stories to match for the book. Uh, we were in the Coots routine during mating season and it was action packed. <laughs> so here's an excerpt from that story from the field. Then there's Brutus, an old male at Mouse Creek. He's one of the veterans of the Coots at a ripe age of over 30. He's a big bear. His eyes are tired and he moves slowly. His left ear is partially missing and he has many small scars along the left side of his neck from fights gone by. Over the years, this bear has held his ground against other big males and he's won. His fur is rough and worn with age. He's occupying Mouse Creek because he is the king, but he's lost weight over hibernation and his hip bones jut prominently from his backside. In the past three days, he's moved less than 200 meters from one end of Mouse Creek to the other, but he doesn't care about our boat. He doesn't seem to care about anything. His main focus right now is eating and trying to conserve as many calories as possible so that he can be ready for when the females come. He waits patiently, eating and sleeping and trying to get strong again. In Sam Spinocknock Bay, there is a courting pair. These are young bears. The female known as hot chocolate is about six years old. Her courtier is a young male new to the Kutsma team. He's not a big bear, barely bigger than her. He seems young and keen and full of vigor. Being a non-dominant bear, he's early out of the gate, trying to get a piece of the mating action before he's out competed. Hot Chocolate is a very tolerant bear who has been around bear viewing boats her whole life. The suitor has not. He is more wary of the boat and we slow down about 300 meters away to ensure we don't disturb him. Often as we approach, he takes a few steps back into the forest and looks over his shoulder at Hot Chocolate who chooses not to leave the shore. She tries to reassure him by staying put and continuing to eat the sedge grasses. Sometimes he comes back to join her. Sometimes she goes and joins him. It's a funny game they play at alter alternating who is boss. It's her beach. She's lived there for years, so he's in her house. But he's the male, even if he is a little young. He's tried to mount her a few times while they've wrestled in the grass, rolling around and rubbing noses. She's walked away. She's not ready. Courting takes time. A male bear needs to wait until the female is fully estrus before she will be receptive. Hot chocolate just isn't there yet. And so he waits for her to be ready. Patience is a virtue, even if you're a bear and mating season only comes once a year. The next chapter of my book is about adaptation and coexistence. In Canada and the US's dynamic landscapes, what it takes for bears to adapt and coexist varies across man-made boundaries between towns, between provinces and states and territories, and over the international border between Canada and the states. This is a massive challenge for bears because they don't always know how to be a good bear or what behaviors make them problem bears. In reality, even the terms good bear and problem bear are defined by people. Bears are really just bears. When bears don't behave as we expect them to, they are essentially punished through management actions. Some people believe that this repeated punishment can cause bears to be more aggressive around people over the long run, thus reinforcing assumptions that bears are violent and out to get us. Even though research has shown reality is far more complex than these sim simple assumptions indicate, society continues to expect bears to behave a certain way. Regardless of how many people live in or develop an area, the local bear population must learn specific adaptations to successfully coexist. People, however, must also learn to adapt and coexist. Coexistence is a two-way street. When it comes to coexistence, how we treat bears is just as much a part of the puzzle as how they treat us. In any human wildlife encounter, people and their reactions are essential parts of the story. 
a person's level of fear during an encounter can also affect the public expectation of management response. In the case of large carnivore management, fear can shape tendencies to support or oppose government policies directed towards these species. People fear bears, especially when they're approaching settlements or in areas of human use. Think about the last time you saw a bear. How afraid were you? Why or why not? And how do you think your fear influenced the bear or your expectations of what should happen next? Sorry. Uh, our knowledge of bears is directly influenced by how we see them. Grizzly bears in the media and other imagery like business signs, flyers, and films are often portrayed as dangerous. When I Googled movies with the bear, the movies targeting adults were mostly like Backcountry, The Revenant, and The Edge, where a grizzly bear is featured on the cover terrorizing people who are running for their lives. Grizzly bears are seen as ferocious and more commonly elicit a fear response, particularly if they are seen in places where they are not expected, like private property. As I explored this chapter, bears yet again taught me how individual they were, how everything I thought I knew about bears could be upended at any moment, and how you never actually know a bear. A few months after our trip to the Kutsmatine, John and I spent some time in the Yukon. What immediately struck me was how vast the wilderness is up there. With two to three times as many bears as people, bears have all kinds of space, and that makes them different bears. It was on this trip that I began to think about what it meant to coexist and how that is different based on where you are in the world. To coexist requires adaptation. You need to adapt to be around each other, but who has to do most of the adapting depends on who is the more dominant species. In the Yukon, it wasn't people that dominated the landscape, and this changed what it meant to coexist. And I'm just going to read you the little story that goes with these three photos, because it's a great example of, uh, of that. Part of the Kluwani ecosystem, Chattanooga Alsec Provincial Park, is in the very northwest corner of British Columbia. The landscape here is characterized by large mountains to the west, uh, and wide, sorry, to the west, and wide forested valleys to the east. The best bear habitat is in the valley bottom with a mosaic of forests, wetlands, and riverside meadows. As the early morning sun gently kissed the mountain tops with a pink glow, John and I sat along the roadside watching a familiar, beautiful sub-adult grizzly bear. We had been spending the past few mornings with him. Over the week, he had become more habituated to our vehicle and never showed any signs of stress or even acknowledged our presence. The sun was glimmering off the roadside grasses as he grazed on dandelions and local weed. Everything was quiet and still, except my bladder, which was full of coffee and in need of relief. I slowly opened the car door. The bear didn't even look up. I stepped out of the vehicle and closed the door behind me. The bear didn't look up. I took two steps away from the car. He didn't look up. I crossed the road away from the bear, no reaction. I took a step into the opposite ditch, crouched down and peed. He bluff charged me. I looked over my shoulder and he was staring at me intently. I felt confused and more than a little nervous. I took a deep breath and tried to sound relaxed and non-threatening as I spoke to him in a calm voice. Oh, hi bear. It's okay, buddy. I stood up and walked slowly, but purposefully back to the Jeep with him watching me the whole time. I put the vehicle between me and the bear and he sidestepped to watch me get back in the car. Even though he'd had no reaction to me previously, he was clearly watching me the whole time. He didn't like that at all, John said once I was back in the car. He sure didn't, but I didn't understand why. How did a bear who didn't even care about me at all suddenly get worked up enough to bluff charge? What did I do wrong? Well, basically, I did several things he didn't predict. I didn't stay in my car like a good human. He very clearly told, him, told me I needed to get back in my box of acceptable human activity. Over the next few weeks, I played those events over and over again in my mind, trying to pinpoint what I had done. In the end, one of my colleagues had suggested that it might have been the act of crouching down that the bear might have interpreted as an, a sign of aggression, and that's what caused him to react that way. 
still, it still surprised me in this little guy, like, look, he's super relaxed. And then he goes to like, I don't like you anymore. Okay. When I think about coexistence and what it actually means, I think coexistence is living with wildlife. It's a scenario where people and wildlife use the same habitats at either the same or different times. I envision this relationship to be fluid. People change their activities, animals adapt their behavior. Essentially people and wildlife adapt to share habitat without conflict. Implementing this level of coexistence would mean that all people and all animals display a mutual respect all the time giving each other space and access to resources without competition or conflict. While I think this is possible, I do understand that it is utopic and we often struggle to live with wildlife, but I think it's a good thing to be aiming for. The reality is that coexistence works best when we work together. So that means considering about when bears are active. Bears are usually active during the day, the same as people. There are a few populations where bears have become more nocturnally active to avoid interacting with people, but those places are rare. <clears throat> this is an example of how bears can shift their habitat use to coexist with people. In many populations, bears are active during the dawn and dusk times of day, which means that it may be up to us to change our activities or seek alternatives to coexist with them if those are the times that we also want to be active. When we work together, we get there. And we can get there by working in our communities to have bear-proof garbage bins and not have an outdoor compost, or you can have various bylaws in your municipality around outdoor compost and bird feeders. There can also be um, multi-jurisdictional government working groups set up to achieve bear coexistence where you have parks and the Forest Service and BLM and all those different groups working together to achieve coexistence. But I think it also stems from us as individuals working together in our communities. At the end of the day, the main thing I've learned from bears is that a bear is just not a bear. A bear is not just a bear. <laughs> sometimes they're silly and sometimes they stare at you with daggers in their eyes. Sometimes bears make sure you know who is boss and other times they don't even care if you're there. Research shows us that bears are individuals and so does personal experience. Research can help us understand how bears use habitat and what is important to them as they make daily decisions about where to be and what to eat and who to be around. Experience can help us understand the personalities of each bear, even if we only see them once. Look at the two bears in these photos. This is the whole reason why I wanted to partner with John on this book. When you look at the black bear on the right, you can tell he's annoyed. His hackles are up, he's staring intently, he even has a furrow in his brow. The bear on the left doesn't care about you at all. At the end of the day, what bears have taught me is to just be yourself and don't be afraid to make it clear how you feel. I wrote this book to help people think about their relationship with bears and maybe to see them a little bit differently when they encounter them or hear other people speak of them. Bears, just like nature as a whole, have a lot to teach us. We just have to sit still long enough to listen. Like art, bears are unique. Each piece or individual has their own story to tell and perspective to share. Each piece or individual is an opportunity to get you to ask questions about yourself and about them. I look at this piece and I wanna know why the bear is in a tight spot, how it got there, what's going on that, that it had to be there. Why did it choose to be in such a tight spot? And I think if we approach bears in real life and in art with that same kind of curiosity, we can be surprised and elated at what we might learn. So thank you very much uh, for your time and for your listening. And I really look forward to answering any questions that you might have. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now, but this is my uh, business website and my email. And I have a blog with a whole bunch more information about my PhD. Of course, what bears teach us is for sale at a bookstore near you, or you can order it directly through Rocky Mountain Books. And there you go. Thank you so much, Sarah. This is the second time I've seen your presentation. And it's always exciting. And I learn something new every single time. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, we do have a couple of questions already. And uh, so I will start with those, but just to remind you that you can ask a question in the Q&A chat below and we'll go through each one. 
Sarah is on hand, uh, obviously, to answer questions um, specifically about bears in her research and her vast uh, experience and knowledge just in dealing with coexistence. And then we also have Nick Clark, uh, who is with YWI, and Jesse Grossman, who's also with YWI, uh, who often work um, on bear-related um, issues. One of the projects that Yellowstone to Yukon is working on is actually focused on reconnecting the northern grizzly bear populations with uh, the greater Yellowstone grizzly populations. So they have a wealth of knowledge. And of course, Harvey Locke, who has been working on this stuff since, oh uh, well, gosh, for decades and uh, has an amazing array of, of information to also pass on. So uh, to kick things off, I'm going to ask the first question by Tasha, which is, why are you more likely to see a bear in your backyard? And Tasha was probably um, paying attention to the story that Sarah and Harvey were talking about at the very beginning when Sarah had mentioned to Harvey, who lives in the National Park in Banff, um, she said, you're more likely to see a grizzly bear in your backyard or on the trail near your house than you are to see it in the backyard. Yeah, so, I mean, there's two things there. First, in my conversation with Harvey, we were actually talking about quite a specific trail in Banff that is very close to his house, that is a sort of adjacent to and connecting to wildlife corridors. So bears are passing through there all the time. And the remote camera data that I had showed that bears are literally like frequently five minutes behind a person um, walking on the trail. But also um, we are more likely to see bears closer to town in Banff <clears throat> Sorry, especially in the springtime, there's very minimal habitat available because everything is still really snowbound. So people are in the valley bottom, bears are in the valley bottom, and it just creates a higher density of activity. So you're more likely to encounter bears on those trails in the valley bottom. Coincidentally, in a place like Banff National Park, most of those trails are around town. Uh, so you're more likely to encounter bears around town on those trails in the spring. But also one of the reasons you're less likely to encounter bears in the backcountry is that the backcountry is a big place. And so bears actually can be in a lot of places without having to interact with people. So people are typically on a designated trail going to a designated campground and their use of the backcountry space is considerably less than a grizzly bear home range, which is quite a bit larger. So that's one of the reasons why we're more likely to see them uh, sometimes on trails around town than in the wide open backcountry spaces. That doesn't apply to all parks though, because I do think that Yellowstone has more sightings and encounters in the backcountry than the front country, but I think Nick or Jesse could confirm if that's true. <coughs> Nick, Jesse, did either one of you have a response to that? I, Sarah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not actually sure if that is if correct or not. Um, that's a great question and um, is one I'm gonna look into now after, after getting asked that. <laughs> we'll get back to you on that point. Okay, our next question um, came in the chat and uh, it was shortly after you described your story of the bear bluff charging you after you um, had your bio break or during. Um, and so the question is, is it possible that the bear bluff charged you, but he actually wanted to play? Um, I mean, maybe, I, but I don't think so. He, was, he wasn't impressed. Like the look on his face was like, I don't know what you're doing, but I don't like it and you need to stop doing that and get back to what you were doing before, which I totally approved of, by the way. Like it was, it was totally like, he wasn't, uh, he didn't have a playful expression on his face, if that makes sense. He was very intent and, um, and he was clearly like setting a boundary for me and being like, you're breaking the rules, quit it. Awesome. Pamela writes, wildlife managers emphasize a fed bear is a dead bear. In your experience, if a bear gets a taste of human food or garbage, even just once, is he or she doomed um, because of conditioning? Well, I mean, 
there has been some research that shows that you can train bears, like retrain bears to pursue more natural food sources once they have had access to human food. Um, but that requires a lot of money and capacity and it basically requires a person to be bear sitting, we call it bear sitting, uh, that bear for an extended period of time to continually be applying aversive conditioning every time they get close to a human community or close to food. So it is possible, but it isn't often done because we don't have the resources in terms of money or, or human capacity to actually do that every time a bear has, obtains access to human food. So really a fed bear is a dead bear partially because we fail the bear. And we failed that bear from the very beginning. As soon as we haven't managed our attractants and a bear has actually obtained access to human food, we've already failed that bear. And then we'll probably fail them a few more times because maybe they'll get more access to human food in one way, shape or form, or we won't have the capacity to manage them and continually haze them away from a human use area. And so eventually that bear ends up on a path of becoming more comfortable and habituated around people and then potentially expecting people to be some kind of source of food. And that's when they can start to display aggressive behaviors. And as soon as a bear starts to display aggression regularly, even if it's not like making contact, because once a bear makes contact, it's like, that's pretty intense. Um, but those bears are, they end up being relocated or, or destroyed. It's, it's just the sad truth. So a fed bear is a dead bear. Nine times out of 10. Thank you. Don't feed the bears. <laughs> uh, do you think grizzlies were, will ever be introduced back into California? Well, I dream of a day where we don't have to introduce grizzlies into California. They just work their own way back there because, you know, the whole idea of reintroduction, um, if you're reintroducing an animal and the original cause of the extirpation isn't addressed or you don't have the habitat, then a reintroduction won't be successful. These are like basic principles of ecology. Um, but grizzly bears are, are taking back the land slowly but surely they're expanding eastward. And so maybe through efforts of organizations like Y to Y, maybe it could become Y to Y to C. <laughs> And eventually we can just connect all the habitats and bears can work their way back to California. I think that would be wonderful. I mean, I mean it's a bit of a pipe dream. There's a lot of people in California, like a lot. <laughs> Nick uh, or Jesse, did either one of you want to just uh, mention how close grizzly bears are to reconnecting here in uh, the Waidawai region? And is there any is there any um, data that is suggesting that they're moving their way towards California? Oh, I'll, I'll uh, attempt to answer that. So um, the grizzly bear populations in the Northern um, Continental Divide ecosystem and those in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem are, are getting closer um, as we speak. And many researchers estimate that they are um, closer than uh, 50 miles apart. Um, and, and there's increasing opportunity for those populations to, to, to mix. As far as the question of, of their journey towards California, um, I think we have a long way to go. Um, you know, our, our initial goal is to make sure that the, the populations in the north are connected with those in the south. Um, and also we have a, a, a big chunk of unoccupied habitat in central Idaho. Um, so, so maybe that should be an initial focus um, before we start thinking beyond, but it's great to dream big. So practical, Nick. That was such a practical <laughs> answer. I was like, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Go with what he said. That was way better. <laughs> well, Sarah, um, Wayne Williams uh, would like to go big because he wants to know what your ideas are for your next book. Oh, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, John has already asked me like three times, like, what are we doing our next book together? Um, my other passion in my career is parks and why parks are important and why they're important for our culture and 
um, our society and our health and well-being and and our ecosystems and everything. So I'm thinking about a book about parks because then I could go almost anywhere. Like there's parks everywhere. And John and I could be doing trips to all kinds of awesome places, talking about those parks and comparing that to like Yellowstone and Banff and like, oh yeah. <laughs> we'll see, Go we'll see if it materializes. <laughs> uh, Will Hopkins has asked a great question that's very specific to Jackson, but I think the answers uh, can be applied elsewhere. And um, so I would like for, any of the three of you to respond to this. So if you followed the odd behavior of Bear 399 this fall, who is, for those people who are not home to Jackson, 399 is this iconic female bear who is getting up in age and she just had four cubs and she just is an amazing mom. Um, and she typically, if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, stays within the Grand Tetons but she moved out of the park. And uh, so the question is, what could we humans have done differently to keep her safely away from Jackson area? And uh, that might also lead to uh, Jesse or Nick, if you wanna talk a little bit about some of the programs and initiatives that you guys are doing to also do that same type of activity, but in other regions in the Wadawai region as well. Uh, yeah, so I did a little bit of reading about Bear 399 before uh, the webinar tonight. She has a Wikipedia page, like not just a Facebook page. She's on Wikipedia. Like you Google Bear 399, it's like, oh, Wikipedia. Here's the history of Bear 399. I was like, it's awesome. I'm going to look up other bears now to see if they also have Wikipedia pages. Maybe I'll make some for the famous bears in Banff, like Bear 122. Like take that 399. Um, anyway, <laughs> so I also read some articles about her experiences. <laughs> she is a rock star bear um, about uh, what happened with her this, this winter, like fall winter, I guess. I mean, sometimes one of the coolest presentations I ever saw at a bear conference was one of the guys from Montana Fish and Wildlife. And he was talking about how the grizzly bear modeling was showing that grizzly bears were starting to move eastward. And they had done this model of grizzly bear distribution and expansion. And they had predicted that grizzly bears in the next 10 years were gonna have moved this far east. And then he put in place a program where he was actually targeting ranchers and agriculturalists and communities in the area where they projected bears would be going, but where bears hadn't arrived. And he was putting in place this really proactive education program where they're physically going onto the land and talking to ranchers and being like, hey, the bears are coming. You've got about 10 years. Here's some things that you can do to prepare and to be ready to coexist when the bears arrive. And one of the things I read about 399 uh, this fall was her getting into an apiary and spending several days feasting on delicious honey. And I really feel awful for that. What are they called? Apiarists? Beekeepers? <laughs> I wish it was apiarists. <laughs> that's better. Anyway, uh, it's awful, right? Because they lose, they, that's their income. And, that, and I hate to see bears getting into agricultural crops because it is a direct impact to a, a family who's just trying to make a living on the land. Um, but those instances, I think we need to be really proactive and recognizing like we're living in this area where bears are. And so it's up to governments and municipalities and counties and all that to put systems in place that agriculturalists can basically bear proof their properties to reduce the attractants available. So if bears do come onto the property, there's nothing to keep them there. And I think that that's the same for our town communities. We need to be looking at our towns as areas that if you live in the urban wildlife interface like Canmore and Banff are too, you kind of have to expect that bears are going to come into town. Like the town is right in the middle of how bears are moving through the landscape. The idea to me around coexistence in this case is that we create a space where we recognize that bears may come through town we're okay with that. But when they get here, there's nothing to keep them here. 
there's no food, all the attractants are properly managed, nobody freaks out and starts shooting at them either. And that they come through town and they're just like, oh, there's nothing here. I guess I might as well just go back to the forest because there was actually food there. Um, and that's kind of the, I guess that's the coexistence that I like to aim for in these kinds of communities. And I understand now 399 has gone back north into the park. She's going to sleep. And so hopefully she wakes up next spring and just forgets all about those delicious compost in Jackson. <laughs> Nick, Jesse, did you want to mention um, a project or two? I know, Nick, you've been working a lot uh, on this and specifically in some BLM lands. Yeah, um, Jesse and I have, have both been working on a number of coexistence or conflict reduction efforts. Um, one recent, recent exciting project was partnering with the BLM, the Bureau of Land uh, Management Office in Butte, Montana to install um, a series of, of bear-proof food storage lockers at campsites. Um, and this is just an important way to make sure that bears don't become food conditioned and that we're keeping bears and people safe. Um, and so this project was targeted um, to, to recreational users, whether they be local or, or coming from far away. Um, and so that is now um, going to be a, a two-year project in, in, in an area of Southwest Montana along the Big Hole River. So that's just one example of trying to be proactive in an area where bears are expanding to. And we wanna make sure that we um, prevent uh, or reduce the potential for conflicts or, or food conditioning in the future. That's awesome. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Boom. Jesse, did, you, did you have anything to add, Jess? Yeah, I can just um, highlight one kind of interesting and exciting project that we completed this year. Um, up in Northwest Montana. And uh, Sarah, I just really appreciate your words about kind of the unique needs of people and the unique needs of bears and how we can um, blend, you know, those, those two things. And one um, example of a project that I worked on this year that um, kind of reminds me of that is um, that we worked with a county in Northwest Montana to fence an area where people um, take their garbage. Uh, and um, we, you know, help build uh, fencing around the area and then electrify it so that bears can't access garbage for food. Um, and in this particular community in Northwest Montana, um, the garbage station where we worked and did this project was really close to um, an Amish community where a lot of people in the area, um, you know, their main mode of transportation was horse and buggy. And so part of our consideration for um, the location of the transfer station and um, the design of the project was uh, it had to be close enough to the community so that people would actually uh, you know, ride there on a horse and buggy and put their trash in the transfer station instead of piling it up in their yard until they had you know, enough um, where it was worth the trip. And so, um, you know, on, on one hand, like making sure that the area was electrified, but then on the other hand, making sure that it was convenient and accessible and designed for the unique needs of that community yeah. um, was really important for that project. And so um, just an example of, you know, some of the themes that you talked about. Yeah, I think that's a great example, Jesse, because the more I work on this stuff, the more I see how it's actually coexistence is most successful when it's defined at the community level, because every community is different and they have different expectations and understandings of bear behavior, but also the bears are different and how they use the landscape around the community is different. And so it's really important, I think, for communities to come together and discuss options and to put in place options that work for them as a community and also move closer towards coexistence. Awesome, I'm just conscious of the time, it's 6.06. Um, we're gonna have one more question. And I think what we're going to do is, uh, Sarianne, if you can confirm, can we uh, collect all of these questions and answer them after the presentation uh, by email? Um, you know, I don't know if it saves the questions. I'm looking here. 
but just in case I will screenshot them and then I will send them out and make sure we have access to all of those. Yeah. Great. So we'll try and get back to you and we will be sending out the recording to everyone. Um, so if you want to pass the, this on, of course you can. And just one more plug in case people do have to pop off. Um, we will include in that email the link to where you can get the book, but you can buy the book at your local bookstore. And I do believe that it's even available like on Amazon. So there's lots of different options for you. Yep, anywhere, anywhere books are sold. But just like I said at the White Museum talk, I really think it's important to support our independent bookstores because they really keep artists uh, like now like me, I guess, um, alive and uh, they really support our local communities. So if you have an independent bookstore, uh, ask them to bring it in or buy it from them. Great. Okay, I'm gonna come For the last question, I'm gonna actually combine two, one from Pamela Williams and the other from Francis Reed. And uh, they are, we've heard about bear bells as a way of um, alerting bears to your presence on trails. Uh, what is your opinion on them? Do they work? And the second piece of that is, you've mentioned uh, the length of claws, on, the difference of length of claws on black bears to grizzlies. Do grizzly bears climb trees? Okay, so bear bells, really quickly, I mean, they function to annoy everybody else around you. So. <laughs> If that's your objective, good job. Uh, bear bells don't actually work to deter bears because they become white noise in the background. It's like too consistent of a sound. Um, in, in reality, the best noise maker that you can use to alert bears of your presence is your voice and it's free. And the great thing about your voice is that it varies in intonation and pitch and volume. And so it doesn't become white noise in the background. And bears, I mean, you kind of have to think when you're walking through the landscape, you're in the bear's house. Like it knows the trails. It knows where people are moving through the landscape. And so as you're talking, as you're going up a trail, that bear can actually process that information and and get a sense of where you are. And then it can decide where it wants to be to see you or to not see you. So um, I make a lot of noise on trails. I hike, hike and sing is, is always a favorite, but I also have taken up learning to yodel. And so sometimes I practice my yodeling on trails, which is always really entertaining when somebody comes around the corner and is like, oh, that was you. I'm like, yeah, I'm not very good at it, but it's a really good time. Uh, so use your voice. It's way better than a bear bell. And then the other thing, what was, oh yeah, the claws and can grizzly bears climb trees. So my outdoor ed teacher, when I was in grade eight, he used to tell me, never climb a tree to get away from a bear because a black bear can climb a tree after you and a grizzly bear can just shake you out of it. And I've seen some footage of grizzly bears, like they, they don't really climb trees, like black bears are actually climbing the tree. But grizzly bears are just like launching themselves up a tree and they can get pretty high up as they're just like stubbornly launching themselves into the air. And one of our mountain guides here in Canmore has, a, has, a, has an amazing story of a grizzly bear uh, chasing him up a tree and he was 60 feet off the ground and he thought this bear was still gonna get him. So, uh, so 60 feet is pretty high. And that bear wasn't climbing. He was just sheer launching that was getting him that high off the ground. So don't climb a tree to get away from a bear. It's really not effective. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, I just wanted to close by saying it's really pretty amazing that you know close to 200 people united for a little over an hour to talk about this amazing or these amazing iconic bears from grizzlies and black bears and polar bears. And that really animals like this connect all of us literally from coast to coast, continent to continent. Um, and so it's super, we're just super thrilled that we could present this to all of you and then we could share in this and that Sarah, we could hear a little bit more about your work and the stories and your knowledge. And so thank you very much. Um, I also wanted to take a moment to thank Sari Ann and of course the National Museum of Wildlife Art. We're so thrilled to have this partnership 
And for those of you, we will hopefully be having more um, in 2021. So watch for that. We have some really exciting um, thoughts on different speakers that we're going to be having. And if you have any suggestions, by all means, send us an email. And finally, uh, definitely wanted to thank uh, Nick Clark, who is our High Divide Project Coordinator, and Jesse Grossman, who's our Cabinet Purcell Mountain Coordinator Project Coordinator. That's one of the longest titles I think we have. And of course, Harvey Locke, who is uh, the Senior Advisor and Co-Founder of Yellowstone to Yukon, as well as Nature Needs Half. Thank you for your time. Thank you for uh, sharing the information with all of these folks. And uh, that's about it from this end of the world. So once again, we'll send you an email, we'll send you the presentation, and last but not least, we will let you know how to get Sarah's book. And we will also email those of you who sent some questions that we were not able to get to. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. That was super fun. Happy holidays, everybody. Stay safe and enjoy whatever COVID lockdown looks like in your world. Drink lots of rum and eggnog. That cures everything. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Happy holidays.